I'm Larry Walther. This is PrinciplesofAccounting.com, Chapter 16. This module considers tools for financial statement analysis. Now, recognize that CPAs and the Securities and Exchange Commission and so forth provide safeguards to ensure the integrity of reported financial information. That's entirely different than suggesting that a particular company might be a good investment. In other words, a report that shows that a company has more debt than assets and is losing money that can be reported with great integrity, and those financial statements might be filed and accepted with the SEC and audited by a CPA. That doesn't guarantee that something's a good investment. So someone needs to look at financial reports when they're considering loaning money or making an investment in a company. They need to look at financial statements very carefully and see what information is communicated. And throughout the textbook, you've seen a number of ratios that have been illustrated. I tried to integrate each of the ratios that are, that are typical into the textbook, through the textbook, as, as those subjects made sense. The, the ratios are key metrics or key indicators that can be used to summarize financial position, performance, and so forth, and use that for a comparative basis with other companies. What I wish to do next is review the ratios that you've been exposed to in your studies to this point. Ratios can be divided into certain types or categories of ratios. I've identified two liquidity ratios, liquidity or a company's cash or near to cash position, its ability to meet obligations as they come due. In chapter four, we saw the current ratio, which is current assets divided by current liabilities. On the far right are some calculations of a current ratio for Emerson Corporation. In the textbook, the financial statements for Emerson Corporation are presented. You might want to open up or look alongside in your textbook and see if you can find the amount for current assets, current liabilities to come up with that ratio. You can pause the video if you need to. Another ratio is the quick ratio. It's a measure of liquidity also. It's even tied to a more stringent definition of liquidity though. Rather than looking at total current assets, it looks at the current assets that are very near to cash, which include cash, short-term receivables, and account receivables, divided by the current liabilities. And there again is the value for Emerson Corporation. It appears in both cases that Emerson's Corporation liquidity as expressed to the current ratio and the quick ratio are both in pretty good shape. Another family or category of ratios are the debt service ratios. We have debt to total assets that was introduced in chapter 13. It's the percentage of assets that are financed by long-term and short-term debt, total debt divided by total assets. A similar ratio, debt to total equity, where we divide total debt by total equity. Times interest earned was also introduced in chapter 13. It is the amount of income before taxes and interest divided by the interest charges. Now, if you might look at other textbooks and finance books. You'll find this ratio calculated several different ways, but in the main, what it's an attempt to do is show how many times you have money available to cover your fixed interest obligation before you would run into financial stress. Emerson's apparently doing pretty good at $1,400,000 in income before taxes and interest. Their interest expense or interest charges are $100,000 for the period, so they've got their interest covered at least 14 times. Turnover ratios is another category. In chapter seven, we introduced accounts receivable turnover ratio. It measures the frequency of the collection cycle. It's used to monitor credit policies. It's net credit sales divided by average net accounts receivable. And then from chapter eight, we introduced the inventory turnover ratio, which is the cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. If these ratios are changing for a particular business, it can be indications of building credit risk, a company's not collecting their receivables, or building inventory, they're not turning their inventory on a, on a consistent basis. So important to monitor those particular turnover ratios. We've got certain profitability ratios. Net profit on sales was introduced in chapter five. It's net income divided by net sales often used for comparing one business to another. Companies in the same industry, you would probably expect them to have similar profit rates, but that's not always the case. Gross profit margin is gross profit divided by net sales. Of course, it compares that intermediate income number before considering all of your operating expenses. A return on assets is the net income plus the interest expense. It's how much is being made before interest divided by the average assets. So this company is generating a 28% return on its invested average assets. And return on equity is somewhat similar. We do need to subtract preferred dividends, so it's the net income less the portion that needs to be distributed as preferred dividends divided by the average common equity. And this Emerson appears to be doing quite well with a 48% return on equity. 
There are certainly other indicators. We looked in chapter 15 at earnings per share, which is the income available to common shareholders divided by the weighted average number of shares. We looked at the price earnings ratio, which compares the market price of the stock to the earnings per share. The dividend yield, which are the cash dividends divided by the market price per share of the stock. Dividend payout ratio, which is what proportion of the income is being paid out in dividends, or in other words, dividends divided by earnings. And then the book value per share in common equity divided by the number of common shares outstanding. Beyond just the ratios, the textbook also presents an illustration for Emerson Corporation using common size financial statements. This is simply ratios. For example, for 2OX5, cash was 17% of total assets, receivables are 21% of assets, and so it would go. That's interesting and probably apparent where the numbers come from, but also important is to monitor year to year. So for example, something that jumps out at me in this illustration is that in 2OX5, long-term loans were 22% of total liabilities plus equity, whereas in the previous year it was 50%. Notice that equity is now 71% of the organization's financing the prior year, 43%. So it, it very much quickly at a glance tells you, you know, how things are ebbing and flowing within an organization in terms of its overall financial structure. We could do a similar presentation for a, a common size income statement.